Good morning, third graders, and welcome to your very first virtual wit and wisdom lesson on Edpuzzle. So I'm going to dive in uh, right away here, and we're going to start with our essential question. Why do people explore the sea? This is something we're going to be um, exploring uh, throughout our module one. Our next question, the focusing question for this lesson, is how do artists explore the sea? And your content framing question, that asks, what is the central message of the sea wind? And the sea wind is actually a poem written by author Sarah Teasdale. And we're going to be reading that today and thinking about the central message was the main thing that she wants us to take away from that poem. And then we have, why is it important to write and complete sentences? This is a craft question because it actually helps us become a better writer when we think about this. So what we're going to start with is we're going to start by thinking about what the word explore means. Think about that. You've heard the word explore before, and now it's time for you to think about the definition of that word, explore. I'll give you two. Explore is a verb. It can mean to travel through a place in order to learn more about it, or it could mean to learn about something in detail. So which definition of explore makes the most sense in the essential question and focusing question we've just asked? Think about that. Are we, are our people and artists all traveling through the place in order to learn more about it? Or are they learning about it in detail? So we have vocabulary words. It says vocabulary journal, but we are not going to be keeping these in a journal. These are just words that are important for us to understand um, before we read our poem. So we have stately which means in a slow and important manner. And then we have shoon, which is a noun, and that mean, that is an old-fashioned word for shoes. And you can see in our little cartoon here, uh, it's, it's an old-fashioned cobbler uh, and a man pointing at his shoes. So then we have marsh. A marsh is a type of wetland. It is very similar to a swamp, except that most marshes have mostly grasses. So I'm what, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read the poem, The Sea Wind by Sarah Teasdale. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to write what you notice about this poem and what you wonder about this poem. So I will read and then you go ahead and answer. I am a pool in a peaceful place. I greet this great sky face to face. I know the stars and the stately moon and the wind that runs with rippling shoon. But why does it always bring to me the far off beautiful sound of the sea? The marsh grass weaves me a wall of green, but the wind comes whispering in between. In the dead of night when sky is deep, the wind comes waking me out of sleep. Why does it always bring to me the far off terrible call of the sea? All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to shift our focus and talk more about the sea wind as a poem. So let's look at this slide. It says the sea wind is a poem. It is organized into two stanzas and each stanza consists of lines. So let's look at these words uh, and their definitions. A line is a noun, and it's a group of words arranged in a row in a poem. A stanza is also a noun, and it's a group of lines in a poem. So as we take a look at our poem, how many lines do you see in that first stanza? And then how many stanzas are in this poem? All right. So let's look at this, these first, these first questions. What is the effect of repeating words and phrases in the poem? So you're going to answer that. 
And what words or phrases does the speaker repeat in the poem? So think about the words or phrases that are repeated in the, in the, in the poem and think about why the author might repeat those. What does that do? So in this poem, the speaker is using figurative language. And figurative language is something we're going to talk about a little bit more, but I'll give you an example real quick. Um, one example is in this second stanza where it says, the wind comes whispering. And let's talk about the definition of figurative language and why the wind is whispering is an example. Figurative language is language that expresses one thing in terms normally used to express another. So what that means is when we think of whispering, you don't normally think of wind whispering, do you? Think about who or what you think are whispering. When you think of whispering, you probably think of a person. So this language is expressing whispering in terms used normally used by a person, but we're using it for another. We're using it for wind. So that makes this, uh, that makes this an example of non-literal language, which is that bottom word. This is using the meaning other than the ordinary exact meaning of a word or words. And then our literal, that middle definition, I'm sorry I did this out of order, that literal definition is using the exact uh, ordinary meaning of a word or words. So another example might be um, if we were in class and um, Max is doing an awesome job and he's answering all my questions right and he's answering them quickly. And so I might say, Max, you are on fire. Now, is everyone going to run out of the room screaming because they're afraid because Max is on fire? No, because I'm not using the literal definition. That's figurative language. That is non-literal because... Max isn't literally on fire. It just means that he's doing such a great job in answering all those questions really quickly. And I said that he was on fire. Does that make sense? All right. So we have our poem here again. What do you notice about the figurative language in each stanza? Think about this first stanza. The language is beautiful and dreamy in the first stanza, making the sea sound like a pleasant place. But when you look at the second stanza, the figurative language is a little scary. So if we keep going, what is the effect of using figurative language in the poem? So using that figurative language makes the reader think more carefully about what it's like to hear the, the sea. And it helps the reader understand that the sound of the sea can be either beautiful or terrible. And then what is the central message of the poem? What is Sarah Teasdale, the author of this poem, trying to communicate to us about the sea? The central message of the poem is that the sea can be blank. And now that's what I want you to complete in Ed Puzzle. Did you, did you put both beautiful and terrible there? All right, now we have a stop and jot. It says, how does Sarah Teasdale explore the sea in the poem? So I want you to write about how Sarah Teasdale explores the sea in the poem. All right, and then we have our craft question. This says, why is it important to write in complete sentences? So then we've got some examples. Pool in a peaceful place. Greet the sky face to face. The marsh grass weaves me a wall of green. Why does the wind always bring to me the far off terrible call of the sea? How are the examples different? Think about complete sentences. Which one of those were complete sentences? 
What did those different sentences tell you? What's different about them? All right, and your final uh, assignment for this lesson is going to be to illustrate this poem. Think about it. You've got uh, two, your two stanzas, which are very different from each other. So you're going to have to find a way to illustrate the sea wind uh, from both perspectives that Sarah Teasdale offered. And that is it, my friends. All right, we did it.